welcome to this uh, session. Uh, as you all know, this evening we have got the opportunity to listen to the uh, experiences of different institutions from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the institutions that have been all working about facing the past, dealing uh, with the past, it's of course very relevant for us, uh, for this uh, country, and uh, you all know that there are many uh, institutions, in initiatives that have been trying to launch uh, similar, uh, let's say, in, uh, institutions here as well. And this is a good opportunity for us to listen to their uh, experiences, the challenges, and uh, also maybe we will uh, hear some uh, successful stories, we hope. Uh, we are going to uh, have three presentations uh, this evening. We are going to start with one uh, presentation by uh, Belma Cusovic and Edis Kolar uh, from uh, the Tunnel Hof, uh, of Hope. And uh, then we'll proceed uh, with uh, Elma Hasenbegovic and then Nicolas Small. I'll uh, tell more about each when uh, their turn comes. Uh, as each actually presenter uh, is going to talk about the uh, institution, about their role in that uh, institution. I don't need to say much about the uh, panelists. I'll give the floor first uh, to Belma and Edis uh, to talk about their institution. Uh, and I was uh, actually surprised uh, to hear the abstract they said, which uh, says selective memory is not an option. What it is if it is not an option? The floor is yours. Good evening. Um, so, uh, my name is Velma Trusovic, and uh, I am a museum educator at Memorial Complex Tunnel DB or the Tunnel of Hope. Uh, this is my colleague, um, Edis Kolar and he is an uh, honorary curator and a guide at uh, our museum complex. And uh, today we will present the work of our institution, but our institution is a part of um, another institution that was called, that's called Memorial Fund, and, uh, that does uh, different activities uh, in the um, process of memorialization. Um, so, um, we will tell you about our uh, experiences, uh, uh, the projects that we do, and uh, the things that uh, we, uh, we hope that we will manage to, um, the goals that we, we hope that we will be able to achieve uh, in the future. So, uh, Sarajevo Cantum Fund uh, for Construction and Preservation of Veteran Cemeteries, Memorial Centers and Memorial for Genocide Victims. Memorial Fund was established in 1997 by decision of Sarajevo Cantum Assembly with mission of raising headstones and other memorials to Shahid and fallen soldiers on the territory of Sarajevo Cantum. Um, uh, those are unique headstones uh, that are honoring uh, the, the victims of the war. Uh, main activities of the Memorial Fund are constant care of cemeteries of veterans of past war by building unique headstones for every soldier that gave his life or was fighting in the war for his country, organization of manifestation anniversaries of deaths and other events in order to nourish memories of the soldiers that were fighting for their country in the war. So we have uh, one big central manifestation called Defense of Bosnia. Uh, it's on um, one mountain. Every year we gather and we have um, a big gathering of people uh, in honor of the soldiers because that mountain was really strategically very important for the defense, uh, not only of the capital Sarajevo, but the whole Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
uh, we are uh, const building and having a constant care for memorials also, and we are publishing books and works related to patriotism and war period. Um, although uh, our activities are based in Sarajevo Canton, uh, uh, due to the fact that we, uh, because of the political reasons, we cannot be registered in the whole country, our political, uh, we cannot be registered on other government levels, nor, nor uh, entity level or state levels, we are just uh, regionally, um, like we have these boundaries, regional boundaries, uh, we have uh, found a way to, um, to, to do the work uh, on other, uh, other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, by connecting with a different association of veterans in other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that's one, um, one example of how politics affects our work uh, and uh, the challenge that we have to uh, suffer in an everyday fight uh, in dealing with difficult past. Uh, we also take uh, care about Igman Mosque that was symbolically built in the same time when 614 mosques all around the big uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina were demolished, destroyed, and burned. Um, uh, we also, in Memorial Fund, uh, have one um, project um, that um, we will try, uh, that is, uh, that has a goal of to stop selective memory because we will uh, begin, we began the research uh, that was called Nine Heroes of Defense War. Uh, we are researching for the lives of nine people that were declared heroes of the defense war by the presidency. And uh, we, are, uh, we are at this point, we are gathering information and uh, um, everything uh, we need to uh, establish a museum that will primarily have educative role as we would like to offer our future generation a true a role models they can respect. Um, so, right now, I will ask my colleague Edis, uh, who was one of the founders of the uh, Tunnel of Hope Museum, to tell us something. To tell you something about the the history of the Tunnel of Hope, uh, the construction of Tunnel of Hope, and uh, why it, it was so important for him. Uh, to uh, make uh, his birth house a place of memory or a memory site. Good evening and merhaba. Uh, as Velma told you already, my name is Edis Kolar and uh, uh, I was born in 1975 in this uh, house where today is a uh, uh, tunnel museum or Tunnel, memor memorial complex tunnel of hope. Uh, I'll try to explain you a few details about this tunnel. I don't know have you heard for it, but uh, that was one of the most important objects for defense of Sarajevo. Uh, practically, as you know, probably Sarajevo had the longest history, longest siege in the history. And this tunnel, practically two years during that siege, was the only way in and out of that city. I'm talking about tunnel which was only one meter wide, 160 height, and 800 meters long. That tunnel connected Sarajevo and the rest of the world. Uh, I'll just briefly explain you uh, how we built it. Uh, it was built under the airport, and uh, what is strange in this story probably is uh, that it was built under the airport which was under control of the United Nations forces. Uh, at that time they had the uh, name United Nations Protection Forces. Probably it's strange for you, uh, and uh, you ask yourself why it was necessary that we build a tunnel uh, to survive under the people who came here who came there to, 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 to help us, but fortunately for us, we had that possibility to build it and we survived. 
maybe this is critical about United Nations, but they admit all their mistakes after the war, and uh, uh, that tunnel was built by the army, Bosnian army. Also, some civil engineers were involved in that work. Digging uh, lasted four months and four days. Uh, it's interesting also to say that uh, we dug this tunnel from both sides at the same time. Uh, how we met down without any instruments and without technology, I personally cannot explain it because even I don't understand. But we met, 30th of July was date when this tunnel was finished and open, and uh, we put it immediately in the function because uh, we need many things to bring from the free territory to the city. Uh, on the first place was, was a weapons for defense, but and also tunnel was built as military object. During those two years, tunnel was much more used for civil purpose than for military purpose. We brought thousands of tons of food through it, medicines. We evacuate people through the tunnel. Even uh, political leaders use it to go to the many conferences. Uh, practically 3,000 people went through the tunnel approximately every day. We had over 2 million passages through the tunnel. Uh, the side of the tunnel uh, that we are talking about uh, and where is today's museum is the B side. This tunnel was named Object DB. <coughs> Two villages connect, uh, actually one, one of them is Dobrinja and another one is Butmir. Uh, coincidentally, my house was chosen to be one of those points and uh, I'll try to explain in my personal story how that happened. Uh, practically, uh, my father gave permission for uh, some people who came at that time to start digging that tunnel from our house. Uh, they built that tunnel uh, and uh, after the war, when, 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 when everything was over, uh, er everyone just left that place and practically our house was left destroyed and burned and uh, all those things, you know, uh, that people used during the war who were very important for survival of them were on the street practically or in the field or in the tunnel. Uh, we decided to not clean it up all and uh, put our house in a normal house to for life. We decided to keep it destroyed and uh, we started collecting those things, you know, and putting them in the certain place, in the basement of it. And that's how practically this museum was made. It was already there practically. Uh, I'm also one of the persons who was in the army all the time and one part of the war I spent at the tunnel. Uh, I was a member of uh, one, uh, one of the units which was security of the tunnel and uh, practically I had a uh, lot of experience from that period of the war and I could actually uh, made that place by using my own memories and and everything else. I believed in that moment that it was really important to keep it. Tunnel was not just just a tunnel, you know, or bunker. Tunnel was something what saved many lives and uh, I believed it was really good good job to to preserve it. We managed to preserve twenty five meters of that tunnel. Rest of part collapsed. And now, through this company that where we are working, Memorial Fund, we are trying to rebuild it all. Uh, practically through that, per through through this work, uh, we actually had uh, many uh, problems. First of all. Uh, 
people after the war didn't want to remember those things. Sarajevo was the place where 11,500 people died. From that number, 1,600 children were killed. And uh, pe people immediately after the war wanted just to forget everything what was going on. Memories were very fresh. And uh, probably in that moment, you know, m m the uh, some people think that 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 we are crazy, you know, because we decided to keep our memories and uh, present them to the others who didn't know what was the tunnel or what was the siege. For me personally, it was very difficult, you know, to remember every day what we passed through during the war, but I didn't want to give up and the uh, last 20 years I spent there explaining people what we passed through. Uh, we had also problems with the politicians who believed that uh, for Sarajevo it's not good to talk about past or to put those places into a uh, program of like touristic sites, you know, they call that war tourism, and uh, 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 we fix those problems through the constant uh, conversation, and also uh, through the visits of that site tunnel. Many people were interesting to see that tunnel was some kind of secret during the war and. After the war, everyone wanted to see that. And from this point, we understand that we were right. And uh, probably tunnel is something that will be uh, a biggest monument in Bosnia and even in the future. Okay, well, we will continue. <laughs> Edis and his family take took care about uh, this um, place of memory uh, till the 2012 when Memorial Fund recognized the importance of Tunnel of Hope and since that period Fund has been governing uh, it by the name of Memorial Complex Tunnel DB. Uh, in everyday activities uh, that we do we are presenting uh, we are uh, I have to say that we are the most probably the most visited place in mm, definitely in Sarajevo Cantun but probably uh, one of the most visited place in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Last year we had 120,000 visitors and uh, we fear uh, we are um, really obliged to present the history of the tunnel uh, with every fact that we have. Uh, in a, our everyday work, we meet a lot of tourists and we are presenting them the facts that we know, but uh, also we are there with our memories because tunnel is the place where history and memories meet uh, because every one of our employees um, uh, lived uh, in, the, in Sarajevo uh, during the war and we all have memories that we are uh, also sharing during this guidance of the visitors. Uh, if some of the visitors doesn't want to have our, uh, the, that personal touch, in, uh, we offer them to uh, use our audio guide only with history facts, but most of them just like to hear our personal experience and like to know uh, what was our opinion about it, how we felt, and things like that. In our cons uh, work, uh, we are doing uh, two um, two projects of memorialization. Uh, one of them is called We Are the Tunnel, and the other is Experience of Passing Through the Tunnel. Uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first project is um, uh, the project of, um, is for us very um, significant. We are trying to uh, collect uh, personal stories of every person that was working on the construction of tunnel, uh, every engineer, every digger, everyone uh, that had um, any kind of um, 
that was involved in the process and that's why we call uh, it they are the tunnel and we are presenting the people uh, here on in our premises we are presenting the people that helped the tunnel be built and the other project uh, is experience of passing through the tunnel um, that's the project we are doing uh, with uh, we are doing with uh, schools uh, uh, we are uh, just um, we gave this assignment to school children to uh, find people in their own environments, in their families or neighborhoods that uh, went through the tunnel and to interview them and to collect their experience. We are also uh, doing, uh, we also have one big challenge in presenting difficult past. Uh, that's our struggle to put uh, the siege of Sarajevo and to put uh, the importance of tunnel in the school programs because in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, politics doesn't allow us to talk about the aggression and to talk about what happened from uh, 92 to 95. So we have a special prog program for the children uh, of ninth grade. Uh, children are coming to tunnel and we uh, have the uh, history lessons there for them in order for just not to uh, just for to know what happened in the city that they live in because uh, they don't have it in their schools um, and um, I just uh, for the conclusion I want to say that uh, we in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, we always lived under a parole of forgiving and forgetting uh, but now we are a new post-war generation that is willing to forgive and to reconciliate, but not to forget. And we will do our best in Memorial Fund to stop selective memory, no matter what difficulties uh, we have to face every day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to now swap the places so that they can use the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. It's, I mean, uh, while listening to it, I was not comparing with uh, the cases in Turkey, but the relevance is there. We are going to discuss at the end of the panel uh, both the uh, cases presented here and uh, their relevance with uh, Turkey or uh, the cases in Turkey. Uh, the next presentation is going to be on History Museum of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, uh, more precisely, actually, on a uh, permanent exhibition uh, in that uh, museum on Besic uh, Sarajevo, uh, which was inaugurated in 2003. Uh, Elma Hasimbegovic from uh, the museum is going to present about that uh, uh, exhibition again uh, I hope you are going to uh, listen to the challenges the achievements and maybe uh, we will again uh, listen to that presentation uh, with this uh, question of relevance and uh, uh, comparing with the cases we know already in, uh, in different parts of the, uh, in the world the floor is yours thank you so the challenges are many and I will share some, but I will pr probably more focus on uh, what we can do or what we can take out from the challenges, so how we can turn the challenges into our advantages. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank to the organizers from the Hranding Foundation, especially Nayat and Sumru, who we were in touch with all this uh, time, and uh, who helped us to, to come here and to share our experiences with us. So I'm very happy that we are sharing experiences from Bosnia with the Turkish colleagues and people who are dealing with the past or dealing with the memory in different ways. But I'm so also happy that, in fact, this foundation brought for the first time that I have occasion to sit with the colleagues from the Tunnel Museum and the Fund of Memorial, Memorial, Memoriala, <coughs> Uh, sitting together and listening, in fact, what they are, what they are doing. Because we are probably presenting our experiences uh, all around the place and attending different con uh, conferences, but in Sarajevo, we are, in fact, not much often sitting and discussing the, 
you come to the capital city to do this? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes, but maybe that's one of the challenges, meaning that there is a lack of uh, discussion at, at the local level. So maybe we can, maybe we can also take that one as a, one of the first challenges, or one of the challenges. So I'm coming from History Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina from Sarajevo, which is facing many challenges in different ways. Uh, the museum itself was founded in 1945, so immediately after the Second World War. Uh, in order to keep the memory and preserve the memory of the World War II. So when we are talking about dealing with the past and dealing with the different traumas uh, concerning the museum, we can dis di divide it into two parts, the Second World War and uh, the War of the 90s. I will not focus now on the World War II, that, the, that was the, that what the museum was doing for 50 and more years, uh, but we'll concentrate on the on the latest or, or the, on the recent history, which is maybe more relevant uh, to the audience here. But <clears throat> for example, in fact, what we, how we uh, welcome our visitors to the museum and how we start and introduce uh, the story of the dealing with the past and the war, uh, we start with one of the artworks which are at the entrance of the of the museum, so it's the first thing that you face when you when you enter the museum, and that can explain a little bit also about history connection with the history of the history museum, and also introduction to the 90s uh, war. So the stained glass uh, is the central art piece at the entrance, as I said, and it bears the message of the anti-fascists during the Second World War. So the museum, as I said, was for 50 years, Museum of Revolution Museum, established to deal with the memory of the World War II. And it bears this main message, death to fascism, freedom to people. But how we make this transformation or how we connect this period with the 90s period is in fact the second layer that you can see at this uh, stained glass. And these are the holes, in fact, uh, at the at the, at the work itself. You can see they are not part of the, of the original artwork. They are part, in fact, of the, uh, from the siege period, from the 92-95 siege of Sarajevo. So that's how we make introduction and transition from one period in the history of the museum into something uh, which is more recent. And then we uh, go on and proceed with the with permanent exhibition that we have. So the museum, as I said, was 50 years dealing with the Second World War in 2002. Uh -huh, okay, and one more detail that is another layer at this stained glass is this yellow tape. I will not talk about it much, but it explains the context and explains the challenges that the museum is facing with. The yellow tape says, reads, uh, culture shutdown, meaning uh, or explaining or telling something about the problems that our institution, concretely History Museum of Boston Herzegovina, is dealing with last 25 years so since, since the war ended. Because after 1995, this museum, together with six other institutions of culture in Sarajevo, uh, has no legal founder due to political reasons uh, and is completely let on its own. So meaning that it has no funding, it has no legal founder, it has no budget for living costs and running costs of the, of the institution. I will not go much into detail uh, about this, but I will just say how we turn this uh, fact into our advantage, meaning that we are a museum which is not very much dependent on the politics and not much depending because the politicians are not paying on uh, it or not being responsible for it, meaning that gives us a freedom to deal with the things that in, in a way that we think are uh, good for the society we are living in. Uh, and in 2002, uh -huh, okay, also some, some information or some context about the museum. This museum was 100 meter from the first front line, uh, which is in the, in, in the inner city, so in the center of the city. And it suffered a lot from, from that. I don't know, do you see this one? This photo on the left side is the first time that I'm showing it publicly, in fact. This is documentation that we have uh, 
got from the police documentation that did investigation uh, after the war in 1996. So this is a sniper nest that targets museums. So you see the museum as one of the sniper targets uh, from one of the buildings nearby. So it's a very also nice, nicely giving a context or nicely giving a, or very picturesquely uh, explaining the situation in, in the city. <coughs> Of this, this, we are talking about 92, 95, so the city museum was working during the war, uh, but not visiting, not many visitors, obviously. But they tried to, to, yeah, workers were coming to every day, and that was, in fact, this street was called Sniper's Alley. So, uh, like snipers controlled basically the, the whole city and this area too. So just to give you the proximity or vicinity of the front line, and yeah, this is the first public showing. And this is how museum, unfortunately, looks uh, like today, nowadays, having in mind all the uh, consequences of lack of care of the state and state authorities. But in 2002, we decided almost by chance to deal with the more recent history, uh, opening exhibition in 2003, which, so I said, it started in 2002, starting with collecting material with, from people, asking citizens, so it was open call to citizens to donate the objects they used during the war and uh, to share their stories to the, to the museum. We also visited several uh, institutions operating and being active at that time. And at that time, we were not even aware that we are now, we are working on something very important and that it would be permanent exhibition one day. It was a, meant to be kind of a temporary exhibition and we were not aware of the process we were starting at that time. Also having in mind that we are talking about 2002, 2003, which was only six, seven, eight years uh, after the siege ended. Uh, the concept of the exhibition can be found in the introductory part of the, of the catalog here of, of the exhibition too which you can read here. But the concept was intentionally and deliberately made and it was not to give any kind of uh, political judgments or any kind of uh, qualifications, but to work more on the object-based exhibition. So to talk, to focus on creativity of people, to, uh, to focus on what people were uh, going through, what kind of uh, creativity and skills they developed during the siege in order to survive. So the focus is on daily objects, as you can see uh, here on, 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 on these photos. So water can or water pot uh, made of the oil, humanitarian oil um, can or some canisters for water. So the whole uh, concept was in fact like based on, on this made, ho homemade, handmade, handmade objects uh, people made and found in, the, in their uh, vicinity. Collecting ob uh, objects and stories, so people were starting coming and sharing their object, giving, donating the objects uh, to the museum. So you see one gentleman who came by bike, who was still in driving and riding, uh, condition and he donated to the museum and that became one of the maybe uh, most prominent uh, objects and artifacts at the, at the exhibition, having in mind the importance of the bicycle during the siege where there was no other public transport or it was impossible to drive a car daily life during the siege. That's one of the, the rooms we made. So who is coming to the to see the exhibition. It's mostly, so we have one group which is foreign tourists, tourists who are coming and foreign visitors coming to see the museum. And there are those who are uh, buying tickets, who are bringing money basically. But on the other hand, we as one of the missions and one of the goals that we put in, in front of us was to work more with the local audience. So to work with the local public, with the local community and try to engage them into the dialogue about the, the past. So on one hand you have like informative exhibition uh, to the foreigners who want to re read and learn more about the, hi the recent history of Bosnians, uh, in fact of Sarajevo during the siege and then 
local audience that we give special uh, attention to. So here we, you see some of the uh, <clears throat> of family visits coming to the museums in special, on special occasions and special days that we organize because we are thinking of this generation transfer is important. Um, what we also realized by time that it's also not Sarajevo is not only local perspective and local site of memory, but then you have people who were working as soldiers or humanitarian aid worker, humanitarian workers, coming after many years to see to visit Sarajevo, and they they also face their uh, memory. So I had a chance to meet one gentleman who was responsible, in fact, in putting these foils on the windows. So he was working for for, for UN. HCR, putting the foils on the, on the windows instead of the broken glasses in, in the city. Uh, we also organized uh, different community events in order to engage uh, audience or community by organizing like food events, making, uh, using war recipes and uh, inviting people to, to use to bring food that they used during the war, they cooked without, with ingredients they had available at that time, which was very modest. So they were bringing beans and different, uh, different food and it was a very nice uh, social event where we also put the microphone and asked people to, to share their experiences and, and stories from the war. It was one of the successful events organized. You see people bringing the, the photos and being welcome or being open to, to start talking more about it. What we also learned as a useful uh, tool to talk about the past is using art language and using art in general uh, as a language of um, dealing with the past in a less sensitive way or talking about sensitive issues in a in a less uh, sensitive way, yeah? so not talking about uh, history, but more talking through the arts, through the arts. And then we had, I mean, we had several occasions, not several, like dozens of or hundreds of different events inviting artists uh, to intervene in one way or another. So here I have two works that we had uh, of, by chance by the same artist who is having the first art, the first work is called, this is not my piece. So it's not about art, but this is about present day society and present day situation in the, in the country. And the other one was referring to Second World War and um, the concentration camps, which says uh, Kunst macht frei at the entrance of the museum. What we also found uh, interesting and relevant in a way of approaching young people particularly and talking about the difficult past is how we in fact uh, take them out of their local context. And then we work uh, internationally a lot um, with different partners. Here I, I put one of the, the examples that we had that was done with Buchenwald Memorial and uh, Peron, which is a memorial from the First World War. So to bring young people in this case also teacher, teacher, so it was kind of a teacher training. So we are talking about two projects that we bring, you bring out people to out of the local context, talk about Second World War history and making them sensibilized uh, about the past, not being aware that they are in fact talking about their own past and its introduction to their own past. So it's one of the very uh, like as if, as if we can share the experiences and maybe some good practices, it can be one of the ways how to deal with the past and not talk about your own trauma, but talk about um, someone else or someone else's history that looks remote to you. And I have to mention here that we had here uh, history teachers and also students from all ethnic backgrounds or all ethnic groups. Education, I skip because I have five minutes more or now even less. Uh, dealing with the past, we had for okay dialogue with the with the community. Uh, we recently opened the exhibition on the war stoves. So 
you may be seen one, on one of the photos some nice pieces of war of the stoves that people use in their apartments and homes instead of like with the, due to lack of heating and lack of electricity. So they made stoves out of food cans and other material. So we made a nice collection and made an exhibition about uh, stoves accompanied by the, by the stories, the personal stories of people asking, again, community to engage into this. We are addressing them, dear fellow citizens, <coughs> did you have such a store? Did you share uh, your food with your neighbors? And also kind trying to transfer the, these lessons from the past into like something, some more important messages to the future about solidarity and some more universal values. Objects and stories, war stoves, tend to be very interesting. Uh, story to introduce the topic into, again, less sense, in a less sensitive way. So we have, for example, already offer from Serbia to show this exhibition in Serbia. So to start talking about the war, to start talking about the serious sensitive issues, uh, but in a less sensitive way that people can identify with and that people can find a way. So these like daily objects and com concretely these stoves are like very nice uh, way of of approaching the topic of the war. Especially here that you have like stories that tell that citizens of different names and surnames, different again, ethnic backgrounds were making them. So you have, if you want me to call them, Serb, Croat, Bosniak, Jews, all of them living in Sarajevo, passing through the siege and making like having a need to, to find a creative way to, to survive. So that's the message. Or stoves. Um, one of the interesting also projects that we had is again like getting out of out of these ethno-national uh, narratives. That is the exhibition that we recently or this year had with the war veterans from three warring sides. Uh, people who are sitting together, people who are sharing the testimonies and of their own, so like their own testimonies from the war and then sending messages to the future generations. So we had a very nice exhibition so on, the, on the portraits of, of people who were uh, warriors, fighters, enemies once upon a time, not, not that long ago. But this is something I wanted to share with you because this is one of also of the programs that, I mean, one of the ways that we are trying to go internationally and to make the local context out is this uh, volunteer program, exchange program that we do with DVV, so that's thanks to this we are here. And our volunteer that we are very happy with, uh, Gizem Kigi, uh, is very seriously working on her voluntary period in, at the History Museum, so she developed some, po you don't, I mean, unfortunately the quality of the photo is not the best, but she produced the postcard that we want to, uh, to do something with, to make an exhibition, or to put a sale exhibition, or to put postcards like um, of the work that children made during the workshops at the museum. So that's a work and production of, by uh, Gizem, who, who is from Istanbul, and doing, I don't know, for those who don't know, who is doing a three months or two months volunteer work at the History Museum. Also one of the ways to, and I'm finishing soon, uh, how to get out of the local context is in fact uh, to try to to find a way or to, to see what Sa what Sarajevo experience can uh, give to the world or what kind of messages it's sending to the world. Um, so we organized the uh, workshop June this year together with colleagues from Memory Lab. So Nicola Moll is part of this group, where we invited international memory workers, museum people from different institutions around the Europe uh, to help us rethink and uh, redesign the, exhi the permanent exhibition that we have. So what, how can we improve it? What can we do with it? And really, again, trying to get out from the local context and uh, make it more international and bring in international perspective into it. And yes, we are promoting a museum as a place of a constructive dialogue and a place to talk. And this is how we approach the youngest among us. Um, kids that we like no, are not facing them with, a, with again like difficult, violent 
scenes from about the siege and the war, but we produced or we made uh, illustrations uh, out of the museum objects that you can re you could maybe recognize at the exhibition, the telephone, the st again the stove, um, which we made as illustrations or or, or how do you call car uh, cartoons? Yeah, cartoons. Um, so to make it closer to the kids, and that this I would finish with. Thank you very much. Could you turn that off? Uh, we, it was really very good for us to listen to uh, the experience of a kind of more established institution, but dealing with the recent past. And uh, thank you, Elma, for reminding me of that uh, program, co-run by uh, DVV and uh, Rand Ding Foundation, Exchange of Volunteers. There are now uh, three volunteers from uh, Turkey in Bosnia. Uh, uh, actually affiliated with three different uh, institutions and then Tunnel of, uh, Tunnel of Hope is also one of them. Uh, I hope they will come back uh, with uh, many stories and we are going to uh, listen to them as well. They are going to share this uh, with us. That's uh, my hope that uh, we are doing today is not a one-off uh, event. I hope this kind of sharing experiences and then dialogue exchange of uh, knowledge will continue. And uh, this we will do uh, uh, proceed here by listening to uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Moll from Memory Lab, an initiative uh, founded or uh, launched in Sarajevo in 2010. Uh, the, I suppose the long name is Memory Lab, the Trans-European Exchange Platform on History and Remembrance. And the uh, actual work of that initiative goes beyond uh, Sarajevo and uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Nicholas is going to tell us uh, about that initiative and then about its uh, work with a special focus on uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Western Balkans. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So good evening, everybody. Yes, we had a presentation about uh, a memorial, uh, the tunnel um, museum, then about uh, a museum. So I'm not representing a museum or a memorial, but I'm representing a, an initiative or a group which tries to connect actually different organizations and in which I'm involved in and, uh, and where it is very much exactly about these words, sharing, connecting, uh, different um, experiences. Um, so it's not only about Bosnia-Herzegovina, but Bosnia-Herzegovina plays a very important role in this whole initiative, so I will also explain you why. So f first to give you a little bit also um, a little personal background to explain this initiative. Um, I'm not from Bosnia-Herzegovina. I arrived in 2007, so 10 years ago in Bosnia-Herzegovina as an independent historian because I wanted to make research. And um, I knew very little about uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and the war from 92-95. I mean, probably as every uh, foreigner, you have heard about the siege of Sarajevo. I had heard about Srebrenica, but this was basically it. And when I arrived to Sarajevo and started to settle in, actually I was shocked about my lack of knowledge, which I had uh, since 20 years in a certain way. I had watched uh, the war uh, in the 90s on TV, so, but actually I didn't feel really connected to what happened. I hadn't any personal connection to Bosnia-Herzegovina, and also the knowledge was very poor. So it was only through arriving in Bosnia-Herzegovina, through going to sites, through meeting people, that I increased and deepened my knowledge about what had happened. And not only that I realized that I had a real lack of knowledge about the war itself. Uh, I didn't know places otherwise uh, except Srebrenica and Sarajevo, but even about Sarajevo <coughs> and Srebrenica, <coughs> I realized very fastly that I didn't know much. But then I discovered also a lot of very interesting initiatives which were going on from different people trying 
to uh, be, being involved in memorialization efforts, trying to build memorials, trying to have NGOs, victim associations to try to build up a memory about what's happened, and which I also didn't know about. So basically, that was a little bit the starting point also uh, with sharing with colleagues when we realized how little we know about each other, yeah? How little people from Western Europe know about uh, former Yugoslavia, but also the other way around. I mean, often we met when colleagues from former Yugoslavia who are working on memory sites who didn't have the opportunity to know anything about what is going on in Western Europe. And so this lack of knowledge and this lack of dialogue was a little bit of a starting point to say we should do something. And then we realized, of course, it's not only a lack of knowledge and a lack of contact between Western Europe and Southeastern Europe, but also, as it was already mentioned, within Southeastern Europe and also within Western Europe. So also between initiatives in Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, they didn't have a lot of contact. And as Elma mentioned, uh, even within Sarajevo, uh, different institutions didn't have necessarily much contact with it. And this all in a context where the memories of the war are still extremely present and extremely sensitive. We are now 20 years after the war uh, in a historical period that doesn't seem very long, but it's still something which is extremely present. What I often hear in Sarajevo is that the war stopped militarily in 1995, but not psychologically. Yeah, it's still going on, um, and not only along ethnic lines, but also there are other division lines which exist. Some, uh, something, for example, that I found striking in Sarajevo, um, that there is a very difficult um, <coughs> Uh, interaction which exists between people who stayed in Sarajevo during the siege and people who left Sarajevo during the siege and then later came back. Because actually when they enter in a discussion about, they have of course totally different memories about the war. Um, and often people who left and came back will be criticized because they uh, people who stayed yeah, we took all the suffering, all the bombs, and you left, and you had a nice life in Germany and whatever, totally neglecting the trauma of exile, yeah, which, of course, is also a trauma. And so it's something which is not at all along ethnic lines. Yeah? That's, that's something also just to say often problems, memory problems and other in Bosnia-Herzegovina are reduced to Bosniaks, Croats, Serbs. This also exists, of course, but they are also much more complicated and go also beyond uh, ethnic lines. So this question of there are so, little, so, so much division lines within Europe and between, within different parts of Europe that we said, let's do something where we can try to gap with bridges, um, bridges with gaps, no, the other way around. Anyway, to, to connect uh, these different uh, initiatives and to see what can be done together. And so this was in 2010, we, we started with a workshop and the idea was really to make something where everybody can learn from everybody and not in a one sense learning process because I had also often the impression when I talk with colleagues from Western Europe that there was a little bit this arrogant, stupid attitude. Yeah, we know how reconciliation works. We had the Second World War, we had the Franco-German reconciliation, we had whatever, and now we can tell the people from the Western Balkans how to do it. But it's of course a totally arrogant and stupid attitude. And uh, it is also an attitude that applies that only we can bring something to others. While we realized, of course, very fastly how for every side it's interesting to learn from each other, how much interesting experiences there are in the post-Yugoslav space, which are super interesting for people from Western Europe and vice versa. So this was also a very important point in setting up these initiatives that it should not be one-sided, but really something where everybody can learn from each other. So what is now concretely Memory Lab? Because it's not an organization, it's, Elma said, yeah, it's a group. So first, it's a network of partners, yeah, um, from Southeastern Europe and Western Europe. So what does it mean concretely? It's mainly memorials and museums. Um, so the uh, History Museum is uh, one example, um, but also memorial sites, as you have here, but also many NGOs. <coughs> as a youth initiative for human rights. So this can be human rights activists, but also victim associations, uh, which are also part of, uh, of uh, Memory Lab. And that's also, of course, an interesting, you have when you see, uh, you have much more memorials in Western Europe, what is understandable because there it's already much more institutionalized, while in uh, the post-Yugoslav space, only 20 years after the war, many, are more fighting in NGOs to establish memorials or museums. So we have much more also NGOs which are 
uh, but this is also a very interesting dialogue which goes on. So this is this network of different partners, um, memorials, museums, civil society organizations, and how do is this met, uh, uh, network organized? It's basically the main uh, tool is an annual meeting, so what we call annual study trip and workshop, where <coughs> around 40 persons meet every year and go to a different country. Um, so basically, here is the list since 2010. Every year we go to a different country. And you see also basically we try to alternate Western Europe and Southeastern Europe. As I just said before, once again, it's not about one side should learn about the other, but everybody should learn about every, everybody. And that's why it explains also that we have these different <coughs> um, um, try to alternate uh, trips and programs in Western Europe and in Southeastern Europe. Um, so this is one example, one of the first trips we made also in northeastern, uh, northwestern Bosnia, Herzegovina, in Priador, um, because we wanted also, the very first was in Sarajevo, but then we realized, but I also had realized how little we know outside of Sarajevo, yeah, and uh, how important places of the war um, uh, are unknown, and so Priador is one of the most important places also related to the war where an extremely violent campaign of ethnic cleansing took place in 92, where over 50,000 non-Serbs uh, were expelled and more than 3,000 killed. And where are several camps, they were now all called, uh, officially called in the uh, last um, judgment against Mladic concentration camps, um, which are still unmarked today. Yeah? So this is also a situation we have in Bosnia-Herzegovina. You have many memory sites where crimes happened, where nothing reminds that something happened. They are, some, this, like this was a camp where thousands and thousands of uh, people were imprisoned. It is a culture, it was a cultural center, it was a school, it is now again a school, and it will be again a center of, there is no plug, no nothing, which reminds of uh, the crime. Actually, there is a monument even to the perpetrators, uh, so which makes it even more absurd, yeah? So this is also something, um, uh, we wanted to go not only to see already existing memorials, but to see places where actually nothing exists except initiatives from persons who try to make something. Because this, uh, I think, was especially interesting uh, because this is also a part of the reality, how many people are struggling to try to build up something against enormous resistances of local authorities and others. Um, other examples, so uh, we went, uh, when, for example, um, in France to the history of the Great War in Peron, uh, to Skopje in Macedonia, in Brussels where we talked about the colonial history. Actually these examples just to show also that Memory Lab does not focus only on one historical period. Actually it englobes the whole 20th century of Europe, but then the First World War, Second World War, wars of the 90s in Yugoslavia, communist uh, regimes, colonial history, because we think here also everybody can learn about everybody. Even if somebody has a memorial about the Second World War, he or she can find super interesting things by visiting a memorial about the First World War, because the question is always the same. How do we deal with a difficult past? How do we deal to die with a sensitive uh, history, even if the history is not the same? <coughs> Um, so this, again, shows a little bit some of the places of uh, where we have been. Not all of there are marked, but here again you see this, uh, <coughs> our attempt to balance uh, the west and the south and west, even if west goes also east. Um, another example also, uh, Elma already mentioned it, because we had this thread that people said, okay, we have once a year this program, but shouldn't we do more things? Yeah? And so this was one example to do something additional, a workshop on very concrete question, uh, as Elma mentioned. So what uh, in this attempts, efforts of the uh, uh, History Museum of Bosnia-Herzegovina to renew its exhibition about the siege, to bring together different people from Sarajevo, from the museum team and others to think about what could be do, done. So these are some of the activities done by uh, directly by Memory Lab, and then the third level of Memory Lab, so the network, the annual study trips, is bilateral or multilateral projects developed by Memory Lab partners, yeah? Because many partners met for the first time during one of these study trips, and then decided, got the idea, let's do something together, yeah? Let's do 
some project together. So until now, in six, uh, in seven years, more than 50 projects have been developed um, by initiative uh, of different partners who met uh, through this uh, project. So this is one example. Um, this was for students from Sarajevo and East Sarajevo, a sort of memory walk. Two monuments about the Second World War and the Last War in, in Sarajevo and in East Sarajevo. So East Sarajevo is now in, within the divided Bosnia-Herzegovina part of the Republika Srpska. Yeah? And there are not so often projects which bring together also both parts uh, of Sarajevo. So this was an attempt with students from both parts, from Sarajevo and from East Sarajevo, to visit sites um, <coughs> on both parts of a uh, internal uh, division line. Another example is with the History Museum and other institution was a project with history teachers um, to see how can history teachers use museums and memorials in, in class, in school, to teach difficult history. So this was something which was also done uh, by different uh, organizations uh, combining France, Germany, um, Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. And the third example was also something with young people, actually this were the students, which was called Memory Lab Junior, so uh, some got inspired by the general name and decided let's do something similar for young people, so to, to bring also together <laughs> young people to visit different memory sites, so to try to understand very concretely, so not to talk abstractly about history and dealing with the past, but very concretely on sites, yeah, what what happens with the site, what can be done with the site, what are challenges when you want to build a memorial or build a memory site, uh, what are channels or challenges you are facing, what are possibilities to do it. So basically, Memory Lab is these, are these three levels, this network which meets essentially through this annual study trip and workshop and uh, all these different partners which then develop common projects together. So to summarize a little bit the specificities of Memory Lab, would say there's this reciprocity, Western Europe, Southeastern Europe, really try um, to, um, um, to have something where partners from both parts of Europe can meet each other on the same eye level, yeah? And, um, and where each experience is super interesting for uh, each other. Then another specificity is this mix of memorials, museums, NGOs, which one again can include activists, victim associations and others, freelancers, scholars. The idea to combine also different paths linked to the history of Europe in the 20th century. The focus on very practical questions, mainly memory sites. Yeah, what can you do with memory sites? Um, and what can you do on the educational level, on memory sites and beyond. Then this annual program which we organized, so we always call it study trip slash workshop because we realize that often study trips are organized when you visit, you visit, you visit, you visit, you visit, when the visit is over and you don't have the time to think about what you actually visited. And when you have workshop, you're working, you're working, you're working, and you're sitting in your uh, four uh, walls, but you don't get out, yeah? So basically what we try to combine is really to visit, but not only visits, but to have enough time to think about it, to uh, discuss, to develop uh, common activities and so on. Um, <coughs> What is also something what we are um, try to take care of is there is a, a continuity among uh, participants. So there are some participants who since 2010 have participated at each of the trips, but every year we open it also for at least one third of new participants to avoid that it stays the same group, which would become a little bit boring. And actually, of course, through the new participants, it always gives also new ideas and new initiatives which come in. So try to mix old participants and new participants. And finally, also that Memory Lab is not a formal organization, but actually it's, yeah, it's a network of committed partner organizations. Yeah? So we cannot apply for money, for example, Memory Lab itself, because we don't have statutes, but it's one of the partner organizations who will apply in the name of Memory Lab for it. Uh, we decided to keep it like that because it keeps a lot of flexibility and because we say there are already enough foundations and NGOs of the world, so why should we create another one? But perhaps actually we will create that one, so I, <laughs> I will not, I will not um, uh, be too firm on that because of course it's useful and important to have foundations and NGOs, but for the moment we have this very informal form which, um, 
keep which the main advantage is, is have to have a maximum of flexibility in that. I will finish with some quotes if I have some two minutes, yeah. Um, just to, from participants uh, from these different programs and especially also come back with a focus on, on, on Bosnia and Herzegovina, <coughs> uh, which show a little bit also where perhaps the, the value of this is. So we asked uh, after a few years participants who had participated once or several times to what extent they did have an impact on you, yeah, I mean a practical impact uh, on what you are doing. So for example, uh, one… Sorry, we used the persons who participated in our annual programs. Yeah? So uh, we sent them a questionnaire because we wanted to know, okay, you participate every year, uh, so okay, now after a few years, what would you say where is an impact? So this is an answer from a person from one uh, victim association in, um, in Priador, uh, so where I said uh, where many of these unmarked sites are, these former concentration camps, where there's no official uh, plaques and, and where these associations are trying to fight for keeping up or developing the memory of these sites. So uh, this said that actually through this memory uh, lab initiative, he got also started a sort of uh, consultation process in the local community in Prietor to talk, okay, what can we do uh, about these memory sites and also they are doing a lot of activities so they are um, they cannot create a permanent memorial but on several occasions they go on these memory sites and make actions there yeah activities so they said also we saw other initiatives which inspired us to make here some for example artistic uh, installations for one day on one memory site etc another one <coughs> another person from Priador wrote us um, that it was really something for him in, uh, um, that was extremely important and valuable. I mean, I will just uh, highlight this one uh, part of a sentence where he said, we are curators of non-existent memorials. Yeah, we are curators of non-existent memorials. I find this a very nice uh, description. It means there are the memory sites where crimes happened, but there is no memorial about it. We are fighting to make it a memorial, uh, it will be a tough fight, it will take 10 years, 20 years, perhaps we will be successful, perhaps we will not, but basically, well, the memorial is not existing, but we are nevertheless yeah, curators of non-existing memorials, yeah, trying to make it happen or make things happen right now on these sites, even if there is not a memorial. <coughs> Another example yeah, um, is actually from, uh, I cook it because it's a person from Sarajevo who wrote it and who for the first time was in Priador. And this is, we come back to this example of internal divisions even within uh, Bosnia Herzegovina and who said, so basically I was for the first time in Priador, it was for the first time I talked with survivors of these camps and how much it meant uh, for, for her uh, and how much it gave her also a new idea, a new vision about the, the war. And sorry, I, this is really the last, um, because this is now brings us back now to this Western Europe, Southeastern Europe aspect. Um, this is a quote from a Belgian colleague who said that also this trip to Priador was a real eye opener for her because she had never heard about Priador before. Uh, so she really discovered the reality about the war to talk about the witnesses and actually said that it gave her the idea to organize a trip with Belgian school teachers uh, to Bosnia Herzegovina. And actually, it's great to say that six years later, it was actually done now four weeks ago. Uh, she organized this, so sometimes ideas take time to be realized. But it started through this visit in 2011, and now four weeks ago, 12 teachers from Belgium visited uh, Bosnia Herzegovina in cooperation also with the History Museum and associations in, in Priedor to, um, uh, to see. So these are some aspects of the, uh, of the impact. So it's true I have now more insisted on the positive things. There are also for more critical things, but this we can perhaps have uh, talk about in the discussion. So here also just the website if you want to know more about uh, this initiative. Uh, thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, I think uh, for us, it's again, uh, very good to listen to the people from three different uh, institutions from the, uh, the same town. And then it's good to find out the civilian that 
we brought them together in Constantinople. They didn't manage it in Sarajevo, apparently. Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, we can also uh, hear from uh, other institutions uh, in Sarajevo. And it, for me, it's, of course, when also there was this program sending volunteers to uh, Sarajevo, it's uh, interesting to uh, find out that there are so many institutions uh, in Sarajevo. I was wondering uh, about the counterparts of these institutions in uh, Istanbul and how many we have got uh, here, and then which institutions could be counted as uh, counterparts of these. Uh, I'll give the floor uh, to you for comments and uh, questions, but if you allow me, I would have a general question to uh, all of you. There's a question in my mind, like, as somebody who has been working about uh, dealing with the past uh, as an academic and as an activist. Uh, I wonder what you think about the, uh, let's say, the success, the ac accomplishment of this uh, work we have been doing in, in terms of its reception by the wider public. I mean, in your case, it was very good. You ended up with the uh, feedback from the participating institutions, but I'm talking about uh, the addressees, really, real addressees, the target of uh, these works. I mean, do you think, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the impact, and the, can you see really concrete, uh, clear, uh, uh, let's say, changes in, in some ways? Because in now in all uh, presentations, we have been hearing about uh, bridging, about constructive uh, uh, dialogue about like remembering uh, as a kind of cure, but does it work really that way? I mean, uh, theoretically, yes, but in practice, what's your observation yeah, when you like sit back and then think about it? Shall we start with you, Nicolas? I'm not talking about the organizations taking part, but rather- The impact the beyond. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, um, I mean, the impact question is a, is a crucial one. But it's true for Memory Lab. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. No, it yeah. It's not. No? Uh, yeah. Yes? OK, yeah. Um, it's true that um, the first, uh, no, it disappeared again. It yeah. Ah, yeah, it works, OK. Um, the first addressees uh, of Memory Lab, it's true, are those who participate in itself. But it's, a, it's true, it's a small group. And um, um, so basically, in this first, uh, since 2010, since we started, we would say around 120 persons have participated altogether. Yeah? <coughs> um, and uh, so you can say for some people it had some important impact, for others not. But it's true, the question is beyond that, uh, what does it... Um, what is, ach is achieved, and this is of course much more difficult to answer. So that's why I'm glad about this Priador example, um, and it shows actually also what we were thinking about, because also when choosing the participants, sometimes we say, okay, sh should we choose one from this town, then one from this town, and one from this town, so to balance everybody. But actually at one moment, because we had always at least uh, in all our programs, we had at least three or four persons from Priador, yeah? and some people said, but wouldn't it better to choose, instead of three persons from Priador, one from Priador, and then one from another town, yeah, to more balance. But we realized actually that on the question of when community impact, it makes more sense to have three or four persons from the same town, because they can have a multiplying effect in this, even if it's unfair towards other towns in a certain way, but you have to make certain choices. And it's true when you speak with the persons from the victim associations from Priador, they always say how much it helped them in a certain way to uh, strengthen their own fight for memorialization. Yeah? And uh, this is something, I think, uh, this is one example where I would see a real impact on the participants. On the others, I would say it's much more limited. It's much, much more limited, or it's limited when really to one memorial. So I don't know, a curator participates, he gets an idea for a new exhibition, he makes a new exhibition, but this does not change the life of the local community. So this is a question, it's true, we need to address more. How can we, beyond the curators, uh, activists, etc., um, uh, 
realize to have an impact which goes deeper in the local community because it is a crucial question. Yeah? I mean, it's not enough to have nice quotes. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, okay. to trace. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, no, I agree. This question of impact on local community is, is a crucial one. Yeah? And it's not satisfying. Uh, same question. Yeah, uh, because in uh, Nicola's case, actually, I mean, um, it's quite different. I, I, beyond those institutions, they don't do, I mean, it's not the uh, initial aim anyway. In your case, you are really de dealing with the, the public. And then I'm asking this question because of my own experiences. I mean, we organized all these things, and then those usual suspects, those who are already interested, those who are also uh, already questioning, are coming there and then going back maybe more consciously, but what about the wider public? I mean, is, 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 has, the, has this been a question for you and what, how would you answer that? It is, a, it is a question, of course, but I mean, education itself and all these big words like reconciliation, they don't, I mean, we cannot really like think of imp direct <coughs> impact I, I would say so we are we must be aware that it's a long-term process and you cannot measure the impact immediately in two days at, so if you bring uh, kids from different groups together and you think aha so tomorrow they will from tomorrow on they will be in love and uh, I don't know like go on as nothing happened or is are there, there are no differences between them and you know different viewpoints so it's difficult to measure the impact and results and we should not even take, I mean, the museums as, as education institutions, as a cultural institution, I mean, we, we do everything what we can do from our side, to offer the place, to offer the platform, to give them a space to do the thing. And will it happen in one month, in one year, in 10 years' time? What, it's what very, happen, very, yeah. very, I mean, as we all know, it's not a big deal to, to make th this conclusion, but we are talking about continuous work like a need for continuous really continuous commitment to to this kind of work not be disappointing by <coughs> disappointed by not having immediate success or not having immediate results visible but as a constant continuous work uh, in, on the field and that's kind of a mission that we have given to ourselves or that the commitment that um, we say that we are going to do and trying to, to do this. So, I mean, you know that you are doing, you're working with a group of young people, for example. You, are, you know that you have brought quite a number of the audience or something. You think that the hump people start talking. I will just give an example of a project we did one with one high school in Sarajevo, working on the Second World War history. Uh, so it, the Holocaust was a topic. It was international project, but it was called double burden. So immediately in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you cannot talk. And it was regional in the sense that the Serbia, uh, Croatia, Bosnia, and Hungary participated. And the title of the project was teaching about the Holocaust. So in case of other countries, it was quite uh, simple, so they were dealing with the Holocaust. But everyone in Bosnia related this title of double burden as something which is referring to the recent past too. And it was really interesting to see how this, how the dynamic of the group, because it was not a, like one thing, uh, one project, one event thing, but a long, proceed, long process. So you see how the young people were working, how they were developing, how they were like developing critical thinking. And their teachers were surprised. When, they, when we let at the museum space again, when they move them, we move them out from the from the classroom where they are taught how to think, how to what to do, what to learn. Uh, when they were let to think and to talk freely about their op opinion, I mean, very really great results we we we've got. Like teachers were surprised how their kids are thinking and students are really they are, are they able to to come up to, uh, with these ideas or, or way of thinking. So like you see the results sometimes. You see that th there is a option, there is a, solu not solution, but there is a way. And, and then you, it makes you happy because you think you do some 
something good. But on the other hand, you go out and see what the what the school curricula are and like what kids are, what students are taught in schools, and you get s easily disappointed by it. But if we like see it as a continuous work and long-term process, and yeah, being satisfied with maybe small achievements, and then you think, okay, if you, if we got this group of young people, start thinking. At least that that's something that we should that we move on. John uh, yeah, thank you. Maybe you will reflect uh, from what I uh, been asking because <laughs> I'm saying this because I know that the discussions about reconciliation and everything is actually in the last instance about never again, and then that never again. If it's the ultimate uh, target, to what extent does your work contribute to that? I believe that uh, our work uh, with uh, school children in this educational program of history lessons on, um, in Memorial Complex are our greatest result uh, because uh, okay okay uh, because um, when we started this project uh, it's annual project when we started it in uh, 2013. Uh, we had to have the permission of Ministry of uh, Education. Uh, we had to make a deal with uh, municipalities to bring the ch school children to, to our um, memorial complex so we will teach uh, the history lesson there and everything. And we, uh, at the beginning, we, even we were not sure that it will be successful, that we will have the platform on which we can talk about things that are uh, almost forbidden to talk inside of the schools. But now, every year, we, um, uh, aside of the children from Sarajevo Cantoon that are coming with organized uh, by the municipalities, we have uh, a lot of requests for other towns in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina when they are coming to visit Sarajevo. They always ask us to uh, give them space to, to, to teach their children uh, the history lesson of uh, that part of Bosnian history and now we had also uh, the talk with our Ministry of Education this year. He is trying to put a lesson about siege of the city and about the importance of, of the tunnel in the um, history school, yes, school books uh, at least in Sarajevo Cantoon. So I think um, because we have every year uh, around 5,000 children that are coming to the museum and listening to history lessons and learning uh, a part of history, I think that we have impact on that not to, not to happen ever again, that we are teaching them um, to forgive but not forget uh, what happened or to learn what happened in one period that they to were not repeated. there, yes, not to be repeated.